really about family and, and the family of faith that we have together as we celebrate baptism and the Lord's Supper together. And so for um, Easton and Tommy and Melanie's family, we say welcome. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Uh, we consider it a privilege for all of you. Um, but they're up in the back, so excited, all three of them, and we're excited with them. Um, just a few announcements for you. Uh, don't, don't forget, the, there's a lot of holiday things that are going on. And, and please, please, please uh, read through your order of worship so that you can participate in them as they come up. I think of the top three, I want to mention that um, we have uh, a, a large measure of celebration to do for 860 shoeboxes. Isn't that incredible? Um, and, and we'll continue to celebrate that. Thankful for every person that played a part in, in putting those together and also sending them out. And our prayers that God will use them to, to affect families and communities all over the world. And generally, our shoeboxes arrive, or the last several times, have been like arriving in the middle of the summer. So about June, July, we can bring that memory up to say, hey, so-and-so is getting blessed by a shoebox right now. Um, also, uh, probably the first really big activity that's on my mind coming up is our Wednesday night meal on December the 8th. Um, all are invited to come and share and to eat with us. And uh, that, of, of course, will be downstairs in the fellowship hall. And uh, we're not going to have any normal um, uh, midweek worship activities. Children's ministries will still be going on that night. But we're just going to enjoy a good, good Christmas you know, fellowship banquet downstairs in the fellowship hall. And you're invited to come be a part of that. You see down there some... Um, the Children's Church, hey guys, I'm glad that you're here this morning too, but Children's Church will be presenting with, uh, to us their Christmas presentation on the 12th, and then on the 19th, I want everybody to put this on your, your calendar, on the 19th we're going to have an opportunity for you to reach out to your neighbors and friends in two ways. I, I want to encourage every Sunday school class, every small group Bible study, all of you, I want to encourage you with one idea, what were to happen? If you focus between now and then on adding one more to your group and one more to your family, friends that come to church with you, one more, one more before Christmas. On the 19th, we have our choir presentation. Great opportunity to invite somebody to come. And on the evening of the 19th, we have our live nativity, just like we did it last year. You enter from the back of the building over here and you exit over here. If you want to park and enjoy a little bit of a concert that the, our, our worship ministries are putting on. But that is a great outreach Sunday for you to invite somebody, for you to, to come and say, hey, share my faith with me. So let's look forward to that. We're here to worship a Savior that gives us many reasons to be thankful today. So let's join our hearts and minds together. And God bless you. Baptism is a symbol of what Christ has already done for us. Christ has already died on the cross. He has already secured salvation for all. And we as Christians follow in baptism because we see that John baptized Jesus. And that's when Jesus went down into the water and his, his heavenly father, God, showed up and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine how much pleasure is heaven getting from the testimony of three saved people today? We baptize because we believe in the cleansing work of Jesus Christ. Just like Melanie and, and Easton and Tommy are going to be lowered down in the water and raised up. It's kind of like spiritually being clean. Now, we've already talked about that there's nothing special about this water. There, it's just normal water as everybody else uses it. However, what makes this special is their profession in Jesus Christ. Their believers. This is their symbol. And we're joining with them as a church to testify that we agree with their salvation and the work of Jesus Christ. So it's my pleasure to baptize these with you. Miss Melanie. <laughs> this is this is Melanie Taylor, my dear friend that I've gotten to know, I guess, over the last year and a half, two years with Lily. Where's Lily? I see you. 
I see you're right there. Can you see her? Hold on. Come, come over here a little bit. There you go. And, look. And, and the great joy we get to see from her and John and their family is they've been with us, now uniting with us a little bit more. So, Melanie, who is your Lord and Savior? Amen. So if you'll stand right here in front of me. And then it's my pleasure to baptize you, my sister, Melanie Taylor, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can go right this way. All right, are you ready? We're ready for you. Come on down, bud. This is Easton. Easton, step right on up. There you go. Now, your mom and dad were right there. There they are. Yeah, there they are. They're still right there. Okay. You didn't get camouflaged between now and then. Um, uh, Easton and I have a very similar testimony that, that when another came forward in front of us, we wanted to participate too because of the work the Lord was already doing in our lives. So, Easton, who is your Lord and Savior? Amen. Yes, he is. And so it's my pleasure to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, Tommy, come on down. Step up on the brick there. There you go. Now, they're, they're right there. You see them right there in front of you. Now, you can turn back this way because, to, to be fair, it's, it's a big step of faith for children to come in front of all of us. But he's so excited to be here. Tommy and I have been talking about what it means to be baptized, what it means to be a believer. And I can tell you fully, without any reservation, Tommy's a believer in Jesus Christ. And I'm so excited to call him a brother. Tommy, who is your Lord and Savior? Amen. And it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There you go. So as a church family, we have a promise that we're joining with them. We're a family of faith. This is, these are our family members. So as they're our family members, let's pray for them in one accord. Would you would you raise your hands towards the baptistry? Because they're just right here on the wings right now. And let's pray for them. Raise your hands with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Melanie. We thank you for Tommy. We thank you for Easton and all three of their professions of faith. We do pray for them and for their families. We pray that you will bless all of them to grow them to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we testify with raised hands that we will play a part as your church and as their church. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. From Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those day days, and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. And he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In, the, in those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. We light this candle to symbolize the hope of Advent. Hope seems to be missing in action lately, doesn't it? We read Jeremiah and we ask, God, when when will we truly experience hope you have promised? We light this candle and we're reminded that there has, have always been voices calling out for hope in the midst of a dark world, calling us to the hope only found in Jesus Christ. 
May we all listen to them. This year, we can be part of God's Advent hope as we, all, as we accept the salvation Jesus gives us and follow him. We light this candle because Jesus is the hope that can outshine any darkness. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for being our Emmanuel, God with us. We celebrate your first coming as a child in a manger. Thank you for moving in close in the middle of our mess. We look forward, Lord, with anticipation to your second coming as the risen King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We love you and we praise you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you very much for leading us in that. That was great. Um, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to pull them out with me to Isaiah chapter 60. Of course, this is the first Sunday of Advent, but for many of us, it's the first Sunday after overeating. <laughs> Come on, guys. Thank you so much uh, for joining us as we worship together today. And we're just... We're tagging along the end of Thanksgiving. We're tagging along that we have lots of reasons to be thankful. And, and those reasons to be thankful produces everyday joy in our lives. Everyday joy in our lives. Um, we, of course, with continuing forward with Melanie and Easton and Tommy, did you know that we actually have several ready to be baptized right after this. In fact, we're, we're praying right now for a future of baptizing three more in the near future. And another way this happens is when we as God's children takes on the mission personally out of Matthew chapter 28 to make disciples, to baptize and teach in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we take this personally here. And when you share your faith, when we have people that, that you've brought forward as part of your families that we get to join with in discipling, then we get to baptize together too. So I want to encourage you, one more before Christmas. And make it personal for you because, because you could play a part in the next person's lives that makes a public testimony to their believers in Jesus Christ. One more before Christmas. Um, I guess I should pull out my material too. In John chapter, excuse me, in Isaiah chapter sixty, we get a a prophetic prelude to Christmas. Please remember that in Isaiah chapter sixty, this is still a time of exile. The nation of Israel, along with like characters that we know well, like like um, Daniel, have been taken into exile, and and while they are there, they're not close to the temple. And, and for these people to be close to the temple was, was their, uh, excuse me, um, participating in their faith. I mean, it was like, if they weren't close to the temple to worship, then they couldn't worship. And, and they've been held in captivity for, well, they will be for 72 years. And the, the message of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, is really written in three sections. And the, the first, second, and third books of Isaiah, if you would, and... This part is part of the messianic pro prophetic word of Isaiah. He's trying to share with us some important things. And if you have a, a little writing utensil, I would encourage you to write to the side Isaiah 53. Now, that's my favorite prophetic word of, of Jesus Christ from the book of Isaiah. And to go back and another day, read through Isaiah 53 during this holiday season, I, th I think it's well worth it and really, really important. There's this ancient Scottish legend about a young shepherd boy who, while he's out um, shepherding his sheep, starts to collect these beautiful wildflowers that he sees. He gets all of these wildflowers together, picks them up, and as soon as he picks the last one, this magical mountain appears. And as this magical mountain appears, this cave opens, and he can see into the cave these sparkling gems. And so he, he walks inside of this cave and puts his flowers down and starts picking up these precious gems and he, and he hears this voice that says, don't forget. And he looks around to see if, to see if anybody else is, is, with, is with him. And again, he hears that voice, don't forget the best. 
And he looks around to see if, if anybody's with him. And then he starts looking around at all of these precious, beautiful gems to see which one may be the best one. And he gives his eye on one that just looks great to him. And he goes and he picks it up. And again, he hears that voice, don't forget the best. And so he starts to look around a little bit more, try to find that best jewel. And he picks another one and picks another one and grabs his jewels and heads out the mountain. And as he gets to the, the edge of the mountain, the cave closes up and he hears that voice again that says, you forgot the best. For the flowers were the key to the vault. And he left the flowers back in the cave. I wonder for us, have we forgotten that even though we live in a dark and trying world, Jesus is still the light. And just like Isaiah is going to give us a promise of Jesus, the light of the world, he's still the light for us today. And just as he was born, called Emmanuel, God with us. He's coming back again. Oh, hold on. Let's, let's just do that one more for us all. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is coming back again. That is our hope. See, Isaiah is going to get a, give a prophetic word of the first coming of Jesus. And I want to remind you today that there's a second coming of Jesus. Now, there's a second coming of Jesus Christ that, that can fuel our faith just like the first coming fueled their faith. So Isaiah chapter 60, if you would please stand with me. And as I read, you can read quietly as well. Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would use this word to remind us. Use this word to stir our hearts. In Jesus name. Amen. Please be seated. If you can imagine living in exile, I've never lived in exile. I live in the United States of America. What and what I believe is the best nation where we get to be free and explore freedom all the time. Can you imagine for 72 years living in a state of captivity? That makes me really proud and glad to be in our nation today. Can you imagine living in a state where your words aren't free, where your choices aren't free, and somebody else tells you what to do all the time. We would call that slavery. That's what was going on with the nation of Israel. Held captive 72 years. Can you imagine the despair that they were feeling? Sorrow and sadness. No matter what, 72 years is a long time to wait. For the promise of a coming king, isn't it? No, no matter how strong your faith, 72 years is a long time to wait. I mean, some of us can't wait the 15 minutes down at Bojangles. You laugh, but how many of us get really frustrated waiting? Imagine that frustration has gone to anger, to despair, to feeling abandoned. Isaiah the prophet rises up in the nation of Israel with these, these, this book and these three sections reminding the people of Israel to return to God. Reminding them that the promise that God had for them is still true today. The promise that God has for us is still true today. Hey, the, the nation of Israel is being reminded that they have lots of reasons for hope. Lots of reasons for joy have you forgotten your reasons for hope and joy today? Now, t tune in with me because I can use some pastor words, but, but I really want the Holy Spirit to work a deep place tonight to this, excuse me, this morning. You know that there's enough hope in Jesus 
for you today. And let's talk about that hope for a minute. Jesus Christ was the promised Messiah, born of a virgin. That's why we celebrate Christmas. In fact, uh, Jesus says, I am the light of the world and no one comes to the Father except through me. Can you imagine that in this story now in Isaiah 60, we get the prophetic word for Jesus being the light of the world? Let's look at it for a few moments together. Isaiah chapter 60. Let's just start with the first word. I'm reading from the NIV and I, I read arise. As in, for all of you in Israel who feel sad and depressed, arise. I mean, this is, this is only the way that a bold God can say. Because if you've been in the middle of depression and anxiety, somebody can say to you all day long, arise. And it doesn't really help, does it? But imagine now for all of us, it's God saying it. The one who is the light of the world, who sent his son. Imagine him saying, arise. Doesn't that make us all want to get up? Maybe even in our pews right now. Like, like why were we sitting down with Emmanuel? Praise God with us, Emmanuel. That should make us want to rise up. There's enough hope and joy in the promised Messiah to help us rise up. No matter our circumstances. Today for you, no matter your circumstance, arise and shine. Again, the light of the world. It makes lots of sense. Shine has to refer to Jesus Christ. He is the light of the world. And, and, and let's, let's, just, let's just take a, one note on something. Please, I want us all to have positive attitudes. Amen. But this passage isn't really referring to you shining more of you. And I already think you guys are wonderful. We already love one another. But this is a reflection of the Messiah. It's actually saying arise and shine because you're a reflection of the glory of God. And what is the greatest glory of God? I mean, let's let's compare. Is the greatest glory of God maybe my best ability to be obedient? Is my greatest glory of God maybe, I don't know, the the greatest mission work I can do? What is the greatest glory of God? I'll tell you. The greatest glory of God was His Son dying on a cross for us. That will always and forever be the greatest glory of God. And when we are a reflection of Jesus Christ's salvific work, then we're actually really shining. Uh, like, like I can shine to my brightest ability and it will never compare to the shining a reflection of Jesus Christ. So I hear from the beginning of this passage, arise, be a reflection of Jesus. For your light has come. Um, and this works really well for the people of Israel, the promised Messiah. It, it, you know, Isaiah is speaking a prophetic word. A word for the future. And, and it, their future is going to be realized in a few years. A little, a little church history, a little world history for you. As, as the Persian Empire takes over the Babylonian Empire. And uh, Xerxes and Darius come into power. Then they free the people of Israel to go back to the promised land. But this isn't just talking about a return to the promised land. This is talking about the light. This, this is about the future and Jesus Christ and, and their promise that your light, your promise has come. And, and not only has it come, my favorite part is verse one of these three verses. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. But please listen to me say that if, if I could have you just all of your eyes for a minute and, and, and your in and, and your your brokenness and your in and your in your success, and in your, in your struggle, and in your victory, the light of the world has come for you. In whatever spot that you find yourself in, in, in whatever circumstance we're in, He's come for you. Doesn't it seem so much pers- more, more personal now? I mean, John 3.16 tells us that, that He came for the world. But this morning, remember, 
remember that he's come for you. Jesus is the fulfillment of every promise of salvation. He's the, the promised one. He's the one that's going to lead them out of slavery. Yes, in a very spiritual way, Jesus frees the people of Israel from a bondage of a religiosity that can never fulfill itself. Instead, gives them hope in salvation through his death on the cross. Yes, Jesus is the promised coming light. For wherever we need light today, he is it. And this is also an allusion to the, the rising of the sun. Who was awake this morning before the sun rose up? Thank you for all of us early risers. For all of us who like to wake up at the crack of dawn. I feel like my day's not being productive if I'm not up as the sun comes up. Now, some of you are looking at us like we're strange. We're not. We're normal. Wink, wink. But as the sun arises over the horizon, exposing those things that were once dark. Now, for us, the darkness can allude to our sin. The, the darkness can allude to the state of, of our world. The darkness, whatever metaphor you want to put there. But my prayer today is that we personally will feel our lives being exposed to the new day sun. Now, that may be a little scared. That may, we may be a little scared by that. Maybe a little scary because what happens when, when our brokenness becomes exposed? I'll tell you. We get forgiveness. What happens when our brokenness gets exposed? We let Jesus work in us in such a way to bring redemption. But brothers and sisters, Look at, look at each other because we're in this together and we made a commitment as a church that we're going to help each other in good times and bad. I've said it every time. Do you remember? Every time a church member comes, we, we commit in good times and bad. We are committed to the exposing of bad things so that we can find the new life that Jesus has. We're about this together. And no matter what we're bringing today, Jesus promises us forgiveness in that. Jesus is the promise coming of the light, exposing the dark. My wife is incredible. She is not feeling well this morning. She's probably watching us on, on Facebook. She is incredible about but reminding me to do things. Do you have spouses like that? Like, like, don't forget to do this and don't forget to do that. I get a laundry list every day. And so do many of you from your spouse. You get a laundry list. Mine comes in the form often of text messages so that I can later be held accountable for what they said. I can't say I forgot. I can't say that. I have text message proof. I, I wonder if I could be for us a text message. The greatest message in the world Jesus is the promised light. He is your promise. Don't forget. There's no circumstance that can outshine him. There's no darkness that can outdark him. He is the promised coming light. I mean, maybe we all need to write that down because in today's world, it seems like we've forgotten it seems like we've forgotten the victory that we have, the joy that should be exuding from us. So we're going to we're going to mark at, we're going to march out of here with an extra portion of joy because we're going to remember Jesus is the promised coming light and he's coming back again. He's coming back again in two ways. The first one being for those of us who have asked us to forgive us of our sins, he's with us right now. That means he's with us right now. That means we should praise His name and re reflect His glory to each other and back to our Heavenly Father because He's with us right now. That means that for those of us who have Him right now, He's coming back again. And He's going to take us to heaven because that was His promise. And if He fulfilled the first one, He's going to fulfill the second one. Not only does it say that, that Jesus is the light, in verse 2, it says, see, I feel like that this is a, um, 
um, a joke for the people of Israel and probably for us today too. We all feel a little less happy today, don't we? It's kind of been grained in our culture. And for these people that were, it is. For 72 years, can you imagine? And, can, and he says to them, and, and, and it's kind of like, guys, see? Can't you see? I mean, it's this emphatic type of plea that, that there's a promise for us to cling our hearts on to. Amen? And for them and for us to see. But he starts with the reality. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the people. And what he's referring to is that this pagan world that they were living in, their, their influence had, had seeped into the hearts of the people of Israel. Darkness had spread. Look, I'm, I'm not going to ask you by show of hands, but maybe just between your heart and the Lord, has the darkness of our current world started infecting your heart? Has it seeped in a little further than we would like to claim that it has? See the darkness that covers the earth? If we're not careful, it can cover us too. And, and let me tell you how to be careful. And it's real practical. Stay in prayer. Stay in your word. Stay in your church. It's just really practical. I, I, I want to stay connected to joy and hope. So I'm going to talk to him often. I'm going to read about him often. And then I'm going to participate with the joy and hope of the believers in Jesus Christ. Often. I don't want to neglect that. You see, the, the, the holiday season can cause us to be distracted with shopping. Please go shopping. I want your family to get gifts. Don't forget me. No, seriously, we can get distracted by food. Who got distracted by food this week? We can get distracted by the hustle and bustle and worries of cleaning our house because the in-laws are coming in. Or so many other things that pull our hearts closer to the darkness than to the light. Don't be fooled by this world. There's no Hallmark movie that's going to do for you what Jesus Christ can. There's no gathering. There's no recipe that you can make. But now you've heard me describing the subtle ways that even in our lives, the darkness of the world can creep in and cover us as well. But the Lord rises above. Amen. The Lord rises upon you. And again, it's personal. So again, give me all of your eyes. The Lord rises upon you. Can you hear it out of the passage? It's not just generic. It's not just some random blessing that God throws out there. He came for you. He rose again for you. And He's going to rise again for you today. The Lord rises above Whatever darkness you're in, whatever situation that you claim, whatever, whatever it is, that darkness cannot outdark Jesus. And His glory literally appears before you. As I'm thinking about this passage, I am reminded of another story that's near and dear to my heart. The other day during the holiday season we gathered for another meal it wasn't thanksgiving but there were some friends and family and we we're all sitting around and enjoying just you know a, a friends giving and sharing where life was taking us and our current concerns and also our joys and laughing and and crying a little bit and somebody in that dinner gathering somebody there said this i just want i just want to say it out loud for you why do we think the devil is more powerful than God? And you're like, yeah, I get that. No, really. If we believe that he's the light of the world, why do we think that the dark is more powerful? If we believe that Jesus is the light of the world and, and the light can outshine the dark and it can't outdark it, that means that our worship today 
would be fueled by incredible joy. That means that our families and our lives would be fueled by incredible hope. That means if we believe that God is more powerful than the devil and the light can always outshine the dark, that means that we're going to share our faith with somebody new every single day because we know they need to have the light and there's nothing that can hold us back from it if we believe it. But why do we think it is? Because there's so much darkness in the world that our eyes have become cloudy to seeing the light? Well, today, don't be fooled. Today, make it a part of your prayer. Just like this. Heavenly Father, my world seems too dark. Show up and outshine my dark. Heavenly Father, my family seems a little dark. Please show up and help my family outshine the dark. Heavenly Father, our community seems a little extra dark. Please show up and help to outshine the dark. The last of this verse three actually has the the most prominent um, prophetic word for Christmas, although I like the other ones better. Nations will come to your light. Can you put your mind on that for a minute? Do you remember the nations that came to the light of Jesus's birth? When Jesus was born, there was this star that appeared. Do you remember that? And then there were three wise men, at least we say from tradition, that came from the far away east country, wherever that location may be. Can you imagine? And, and, and you say, but Daniel, I see stars all the time and they're, they're a long way away. Yeah, but this star was over the stable in Bethlehem. Amen. Like, like when I say over, I mean over the, the stable in Bethlehem. That's what. So there's some wise men from nations. I mean, are you getting the prophetic word from the scripture now? There's some wise men that see the light and come to it. Kings that get to see. This is my prayer for our world today. That we reflect the light in such a way that the nations will come to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the promised light of the world. That's what we want to be shining out for all to see. Oh, that our world today at this season would see the hope of Jesus in us. Would see the joy of the birth of a baby born in Bethlehem. Would see a hope that rises above every darkness because it's inside of us. And in case any of us got caught up wondering at Christmas time, what child is this? He's the light of the world and the joy for every one of our lives. He's enough reason for us to wake up every morning and enough reason for us to have peace in the middle of every circumstance. He saves our souls and He saves our lives for eternity. He is the light of the world. One of my first worship songs that I learned how to play on the guitar, Miss Kathy. We had a little debate about it this morning. Which capo do we play it in? I said one. I knew it's the first position. I knew it. And I was right this one out of a million times. Every other time I was wrong. Every single other one. But I'm going to take this one. Do you remember the song, Light of the World? You stepped out of the darkness. Open my eyes. Can that be our prayer today? If we're going to have a song to sing at Christmas, it's light of the world. Jesus Christ steps through the dark and muddy world. Open our eyes today so we can claim the light. Open our eyes to Christmas. And and what's the reply of that song? Do you remember? Here I am to. Here I am to. Here I am to say that. You're my God. Do you remember that song? Because he's the light. Here I am. That's my anthem for Christmas. 
But because he's the light, here I am to worship and I'm not going to forsake it. I'm committed to it personally and corporately. Would you join with me in that commitment? Here I am to bow down my life, my resources, my words, because I want to lead everyone to Christ one more before Christmas. Here I am to say that you're my God. One way we're going to do that together today as a church family is we're going to take up the Lord's Supper. A wonderful reminder that during this season, He is our suffering Messiah. It's our act of worship together that says, I'm yours, here I am. This is our first time for Easton. First time for Tommy. So guys, we partake in this as a reminder. It's just like singing a song is to Jesus Christ. So is the act of baptism in worship. This is our worship saying, here I am. I want to invite our deacon body to come forward to serve us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that we are children of light. Praise the Lord for church family as we gather in the coming days. I'm minded, mindful today of George and Edna Makata. A testimony to our love of our congregation and testimony of missions and work around us. These two flowers given on their behalf. As we go out, let's live that church mission out one more before Christmas. Bow and benediction, please. Dear Lord, a wonderful word, hope. Thank you, God, for teaching us what hope is. Another word, Lord, you give us joy, knowing what hope is. Thank you, God. Another word, Lord, that we're going to get the experience. Glory. Indeed, your presence will be something that we just cannot understand the glory of. Lord, as we come today to worship together, as we end with our offerings, we know, Lord, that we just want others, the ones that are lost, the understanding that they get to see that glorious throne someday. So may our offering be that kind of effect on this world to bring that light to understand what glory really means. We pray this to you, our Savior. Amen.